Hello, and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast, where you can learn powerful techniques to change the way you feel. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski, and joining me here in the Murrieta studio is Dr. David Burns. Dr. David Burns is a pioneer in the development of cognitive behavioral therapy and the creator of the new teen therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 30 languages. David is currently an emeritus adjunct professor of clinical psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. Hi, David. Hi, Rhonda. Welcome to episode 134 of the Feeling Good podcast. We are going to talk about social anxiety. Yeah, I did one a few weeks ago, which was mainly illustrating some of the interpersonal exposure techniques for a listener named Dan, but he wrote a very compelling email about his crippling social anxiety. And we've been getting a, a lot of them. We're going to read two notes, very moving uh, notes from individuals struggling with social anxiety. But in addition the, to these two, I forgot to include another fellow. I can't recall his first name, but I'd have to disguise it anyway. But it, it's kind of sad. He sounds like a, a terrific guy. And I think he's about 35 or something like that. But he, he's so shy that he only gets up the courage to talk to a woman once a year on average. Oh, my goodness. And so it's really slowing down his, his social life. And then his thought is that uh, there's so much about sexual predators and political correctness and everything these days and racism and misogyny. And all of those are really healthy changes for for our culture. But he he's so terrified by that. He's afraid that if he gives a woman that he meets a compliment, like, oh, you're, you're dressed really beautifully or something like that, she'll, you know, call the police and think he's a, a sexual predator or, or, or something like that. And we all have our own... Well, different... I imagine it depends on the context of how and where he says that and to whom. Yeah, and the, and the manner, and the manner right. in, in which... and. Uh, yeah, I'm not necessarily recommending that as a as the best way to, to to get to know someone, but that's his that's his fear. Um, but we got uh, uh, the first email from a woman we'll call Margaret, and if you like, you can you can read hers, and then I'll I'll read one from a, a gentleman we're we're calling Ab- Abdul. Okay. Hi, David. How do you distinguish a personality disorder? Say, for example, avoidant personality disorder from just, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way, from just being depressed and anxious. I ask because I have a strong suspicion that I may be suffering from avoidant personality disorder, and I think if you knew my history, you would probably agree that there are strong signs. I have been having problems from my early childhood until now, and I am less, I am, excuse me, and I'm 30 years old now. Just before we go on with her wonderful letter, we this probably was an Ask David on one of the recent podcasts. Oh, it was? Yeah, and what we said, that I, I think so, I'm not 100% sure, but what, what psychiatrists call avoidant personality disorder is just a very extreme, severe form of shyness. There is no such thing as avoidant personality disorder, but it is a fact of the universe that some people, like this Margaret, are so incapacitated by the the anxiety is so severe that they're kind of hiding out from from life in 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 general and to answer her question can these things be help with the exercises in my books like when panic attacks or intimate connections or the chapter on social anxiety in the feeling good handbook the answer is yes and in my experience social anxiety is one of the easier psychological problems to to help people with but it but it d- does take courage courage before we go on with her note i also wanted to mention just by way of introduction that we can't really treat you through the podcast or through email exchanges this is just meant to be general teaching and it's meant to do two things to inspire hope for you so you can see people who were recovered with amazingly quickly from very severe similar problems to the one that you have and also show you some of the techniques and 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 how they how they work. Yeah, and maybe maybe people could go on the website for the um, Feeling Good Institute and find a therapist in their area that they could work with. Yeah, or pick up the my book When Panic Attacks. Do the written exercises. Do do your own uh, da- daily mood log. You have to kind of 
work at it, but we hope to be pointing you in the in the right right direction here. So continue so with her, her note. I'm sorry for interrupting. Okay, no, that was a good clarification. Also, a further question to you, David. Is it possible to have severe anxiety without feeling like confrontation with the thing you're afraid of means you're going to die? I have isolated myself completely, and I have no social life in any sense of the word. My only real contact with the outside world is through my job, because it's a necessity for living. But it's not because I think I'm going to die if I hang around people. I just very strongly dislike it and shut down or freeze due to all the thoughts in my head about being negatively judged and watched. So I prefer to avoid contact with people. And in situations where I'm forced to endure it, I'll usually find ways to avoid or escape the situation. And just to comment on that excellent point, she probably heard the podcast on panic attacks. And where people with panic attacks may think they're about to die. Yes. And then you can do an experiment to test that, like the woman who did jumping jacks when she thought she was having a heart attack and, and discovered that it wasn't true that she was about to have a heart attack. And it ended 10 years of panic disorder in about six, six months, six minutes, really. Yes. But that, that was not to say that everyone has the fear of death. It's actually not common. And that that intervention is going to be helpful for people. What you have to do is find out what your own negative thoughts are. And then we'll illustrate this on today's podcast, uh, generate techniques that will help you crush your own negative thoughts. And there's no formula or no one thing that's going to work for everybody. That's the beauty of having 100 methods. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, to continue. There are many ways I do this. Since I was very young, I've had the habit of purposefully looking annoyed so that people would not approach me, even though I secretly wish they would. Oh, the paradox. And how sad. Really sad. Yeah. Yeah. And at work, I will often be listening to music with earphones, both because the music calms my anxiety and because it makes me appear less available to other people. In situations where I cannot escape crowds, say in the canteen during my lunch break, I will sit by myself as far away from everyone else as I can and leave as soon as I have taken the last bite of my food. In college, I would often hide in the bathroom by myself during breaks, or I would avoid interpersonal contact in some other way, and so on and so forth. These are just a few examples. I could give you a million others. I am aware of my own behavioral patterns, but still I feel powerless to change them. It's like being an observer, observing yourself committing the same mistake over and over, but with an anxiety so strong that rationality alone is not enough to change the behavior. After and by the way, rationality alone is not enough to change anything. In fact, I don't even use it. Yeah, I don't know. I'd want to know what she means by that. But it's an intelligent comment. You can't rationalize your way out of negative thoughts. You have to have really powerful te techniques that will illustrate. Yep. After 30 years of this, it's getting old. I have never felt any other way, so I cannot fathom what it means to lead a normal life. I have never had a friend in any usual sense of the term, and I literally never spend time with anyone in my spare time except for my parents. As a consequence, I have never learned or understood how to make friends and I have never been in an intimate relationship or taken part in any of the social activities that are normal to other people, like parties, school dances, etc. The simplest things are rocket science to me. So I'm interested to know when a person crosses over from simply being depressed or anxious into having a personality disorder. If you use any of this for a future episode, I'm fine with that. You can even quote me directly but I only ask that you please don't use my real name as to not jeopardize my job and so on. Thank you. Kind regards. Margaret. Which, which is not her real name. Not her real name. Before we go on to the other person who wrote, I'm especially sad to hear this from, from Margaret because you, Margaret, if you're listening, sound like a really beautiful person. You're not... Some people 
get into kind of, I'm a victim and, and they complain a lot and turn people off. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. And you're not like that at all. And what a joy it would be to work with you clinically. I'm, I'm not in, in private practice. I'm not trying to solicit you as, as a patient, but I'm just saying that, uh, you're, you're so thoughtful and, and you're so open. And those are really the keys to uh, to therapeutic success. That and having courage to confront your fears and to do your homework with the the daily mood log, as as will will describe. And then, of course, as I've said so many times on the podcast, since I myself have suffered from almost every type of social social anxiety, uh, I, I I know how how awful how awful it can be. And that's why I love treating social anxiety because I've. I've had all of the these same things into a really extreme level, and and it just gives me so much joy to to show people how to turn it around. My last vestige of social anxiety was was my camera phobia, which I had from the time I was probably six years old or five years old. Being in front of a camera? Yes, I could. I, I hated having my picture taken until a year and a half ago. I finally got over it. I got angry and anxious. And, you know, I just wanted to explode with anger when people tried to take my picture and then say, oh, smile. And, and I, that would make me even more pissed off. And and my wife found the only solution until I finally got over it. I figured out how to cure myself. But she she said, if I have someone tickle me when I have my picture taken, then I'll smile and look happy and relaxed. And so I used to do that, you know, but whenever at that... workshops, I'd say, if you'll tickle me, you can, you know, oh. I'll, you can have, we'll do a selfie. And most Wouldn't people... that be annoying and irritating too? Or well, I didn't mind, but some of the people didn't like it. You know, they thought I'm some kind of a sexual predator or something. Right. <laughs> so it was a little awkward, yeah. but it did work. Because when you tickle me in the stomach, I, it makes me laugh. And then, I, you know, I don't look like this grouch. And when you're going to Mexico to teach, yeah. and I went down there, not to the same great guy you're going to work with, but to a psychological association a couple of years ago. I did a two-day workshop. Which went great. They translated everything, I think, as I was going. I can't even remember. Maybe I just did it in English. But they were wonderful. They were so kind-hearted. But then afterwards, they won, took my picture with this woman, this president of some, you know, Mexico Psychological Association or whatever she was the president of. And I said, you have to tickle me or I'll look like a grouch. You know, and she wouldn't do it. So it made me mad. So I just looked real angrily into the camera. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, because when I was little, my si- I had two older sisters, and uh, for a number of reasons I won't disclose, but they 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 teased me mercilessly, and I didn't know why. And I also looked goofy because I was cross-eyed, and I was real skinny, and and I had these big glasses. And my parents told me I was always flushing the glasses down the toilet. Cause, oh my God. But they made me look real goofy. And they and then I would squint in the in the sunlight, so I just looked ridiculous on photos. And they teased me a lot about it, and just made me made me angry, and gave me the conviction that I I look I had bad appearance, and and so I would get angry, you know, in front of the camera. And the way I got over it was the uh, my Logitech thing here that that I put up my camera. So, right. So you kept looking at yourself. Well, what I did, I saw that you can actually snap photos of yourself. So I thought, I think I'll try that. I'll just smile and snap a couple photos. And then I looked at them and I said, hey, that looks good. (laughs) And I was immediately cured. Nice. But I had that from age six to 76. I had that for, you know, (laughs) almost 70, 60, 70, almost 70 years. Oh, but that gives me hope that any, any, you know, anxiety can be overcome. Oh, yeah. No matter what age. Yeah. And, but you have to want to do it and you have to have the tools to do it. So um, anyway, that was her beautiful note. And then I'll read the one from Abdul. Uh, that, uh, but no, you don't have uh, Margaret something called avoidant person. You would click, click, you would could be diagnosed with that uh, if someone wanted to do a diagnosis. But the diagnoses are just uh, fantasies that the American Psychiatric Association has made up. Yeah, they're and, meaningless labels. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't mean anything. But what 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 is for real is that you have. So, severe social anxiety, and that's something that we can do, do, do something about. In fact, we're going to give all of our listeners a social anxiety test in just a minute. But let's see what Abdul from Pakistan has, has to say. And again, we're identi- disguising his I, I, identity. He says, 
Hi, Dr. Burns. I'm from Pakistan. Please make podcasts on shyness and public speaking and other anxiety issues. I have anxiety shyness. My father also has anxiety. I know he is not happy. I also sometimes feel exactly like him. And one of my cousins, and I'm disguising I de- details here to protect Abdul, his name and other details, but one of my cousins is very much depressed. He, he's, he, he, uh, 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 he describes his job, I won't describe it, but to, again, to protect his I- identity, but he, he always uh, uses to pack clothes all the time, even if they're kept pro- properly. That sounds like uh, kind of OCD. Right, that's what you described before. Yeah, OCD. like he's folding clothes or repeatedly or arranging them or, or something. Dr. Burns, please guide us. It would be very helpful. Sorry if I wrote anything unprofessional. Sad that he thinks it's unprofessional. Right, there's nothing uh, unprofessional about that. Yeah, no, it was Just great. A, and th- Thank you. Uh, and then I got a, another... Uh, follow-up email from Abdul before I had time to get back to him as says, uh, Dr. Burns, my social anxiety has returned back. So it sounds like it comes and goes. That's very promising, actually. In my office, I, I feel very lonely. Here are my negative thoughts. And these are typical of most shy people. I should say something impressive. I'm good looking, so I should not be anxious. A lot of should statements. I should talk to girls. I should say hi to people. I should mix with with people, and the should statements uh, they they kind of d- double your trouble in a way because in the first uh, place you're you're anxious, and then you kind of criticize yourself for being anxious. I you know I I I, I shouldn't be anxious because I'm because I'm 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 good looking, and the should statements also cause shame. And whereas low self-esteem is the central dimension in depression, shame is equally common in anxiety, but more more unique to anxiety. Most people with social anxiety feel intense shame in addition to the to the anxiety itself. Let's uh, give our listeners a little five item anxiety test. And if you have a paper and pencil, you can uh, score yourself. I'm going to read, uh, or we'll we'll have Rhonda read these five questions. And after each item, indicate, answer it from zero to four. Zero would be not at all and uh, true, and four would be completely true. So you go zero, one, two, three, or four. One is somewhat true, two is moderately true, three is very true, and four is, is completely true. So put a zero to four for answer each question from zero to four. So you'll have answers to five questions. So you you read the questions now. So the first question is, I often feel nervous or embarrassed in social situations. So that would be zero, not at all true, one, somewhat true, two, moderately true, true, three, very true, and four, Completely true. Here's the second question. I often feel like I don't have anything to say in social situations. And rate that zero to four from not at all true to completely true. I often feel anxious or insecure in social situations. And again, zero would be not at all true. Four would be completely true. So you go zero, one, two, three, or four. I often feel shy or uncomfortable around others. Not at all true would be zero all the way up to four. Completely true. And the last question, I am afraid of looking awkward or foolish in front of others. And again, give that a zero to four, depending on if that's not at all true. Somewhat true would be one. Two is moderately true. Three is very true. And four is completely true. So now you can add up your score on those five items. And and if they were all zeros, your score will be zero. And if they were all completely true, your score would be would be twenty. And so, uh, once you add up your score, here here's the scoring key. And again, this is just on the severity 
of, of your shyness or your anxiety around other, other people. It's not diagnosing a mental disorder, as you, psychiatrists are prone to do, but just do you have this problem? If your, if your score is zero, that means no social anxiety at all, and that's, that's terrific. You're one of the people who's, who's blessed by not being anxious around other people. A score of one to two would be minimal uh, social anxiety, uh, kind of in the range of normal, I would say. A score of four or five, where you're somewhat true or, or moderately true on all of these, would, would be, uh, um, that would be mild social anxiety. And then six to 10 would be moderate. 11 to 15 would be severe social anxiety. And then 16 to 20 would be very severe social anxiety. And most of the people I've treated have been in, you know, the range of 18, 18 to 20. So, so David, can I ask you what your score was? Did you score Well, yourself? it would have been, you know, 18 or something. I mean, it'd be more or less zero now. Uh-huh. But, uh, oh, so you've got a I, six. I did it. I, I gave myself a six. So you, you have like mild, mild social anxiety. Moderate. Oh, I see. Yeah. Does that seem accurate? Yeah, it seems really accurate. Oh, okay. All right. Well, we, we, we could have treated you, but we've got, <laughs> we've got Jason all, all worked up. Um, so uh, I, 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 one thing is that when, when you're working on any problem, and we talked about this in our specificity podcast that you always start with a specific example. I, we can't treat anybody in a general way. Uh, and so I ask a person to describe one moment when you're upset, whether it's a conflict with the, a loved one or depression, or in this case, uh, social anxiety. Oh, by the way, I want to give a plug to my book, One Panic Attack. So I'll put that picture in the show notes because nice. that's, you know, one of my more recent books. And it's just, there's 40 techniques there for dealing with any type of, of anxiety. But I always start with what's called a, a daily mood log, and that would be how you're thinking and feeling at, at one particular moment. And that's all of the therapy flows from that, from that daily mood log. And in the daily mood log, uh, which we've mentioned in previous podcasts, there's five steps you just describe at the top of it a specific moment when you felt upset, then you circle your negative emotions and rate each type of negative emotion from zero to 100. Then you write down your negative thoughts and you identify the distortions in those negative thoughts. And then you substitute more positive and realistic thoughts. And I'll put Jason's mood log up. This is an earlier version of the daily mood log, but it'll be, it'll be good, good enough for our, for our purposes. Now this was a, a, a young man in early twenties who was, you know, a pretty good looking fellow, a pretty smart fellow, a good, good sense of humor. But he had just a crippling, crippling social anxiety and he was, he was afraid to talk with, with, with women or girls, whatever word you want to use, because he'd get all, you know, intensely anxious. So his, he had buddies and things, but, but he didn't have any social life in the sense of dating. And that's what he wanted help with. And so I asked him to describe one specific moment and it was standing in line at the grocery store on a Saturday and, and he was waiting to check his groceries and he noticed that the woman checking the groceries was attractive. So he, and he thought she was giving him in the eye a little bit. So, so he thought, well, I'll, uh, maybe I can say something to her when I check the groceries and, uh, try to flirt with her a little bit or even just speak with her would, would be a huge accomplishment. And this idea made him very panicky. And so he, his, his, he's, he's, he circled that he was feeling down 50%, anxious. 99. Uh, yeah, 99%. Uh, guilty, 95%. Inferior, 95%. Self-conscious, 99%. Discouraged, 90%. Frustrated, 90%. Angry, 90%. Now, 
Why is he feeling that way, Rhonda? What, what's causing his negative? Because he has a lot of negative thoughts that are di- driving those uncomfortable feelings. Right. Exactly. And here's here's the negative thoughts he wrote down. And let me say that he believed each one of them a hundred percent. One, he's telling himself, and, and those of you who are socially anxious, I, I just know you're going to be able to identify with this. I don't have anything interesting to say. Number two, I never succeed with the really good-looking girls. Number three, I don't have time to deal with a relationship right now, even if I do end up having a good conversation with her. That's kind of a rationalization thought. Um, Four, I better just keep my mouth shut since I might say something stupid and upset her. And see, that was the same as the guy I mentioned early in the show. You know, if I try to talk with a woman, you know, she'll, she'll get all... All upset. I'll say right. something I'll stupid, say something inappropriate. Or offensive. Yeah. Uh, and then number five, people will think I'm a self-centered jerk if I try to flirt with her. N- number six, I shouldn't be so loud and obnox- obnoxious. If I'm humble and quiet, people will like me more. So I think he thinks if he flirts with her, people will see him as some loud and obnoxious fellow. Number seven, he's saying, I have no personality. Ouch. Yeah. Eight, I must be a terrible person because I'm so concerned with superficial things like success and looks. And that, that, that's such a cool thought, you know. So many of us have that thought. <laughs> yes, yeah. And so many of us are, are kind of uh, obsessed with superficial things. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, like success and, and, and looks. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's kind of evolutionary, right? Exactly. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, it's programmed into our brains. Number nine, if I tried to flirt with her, I'd probably get shot down. That's a key one. And then the final one, that would show what, what a loser I am. Now, we're going to do a little quick exercise with you listeners, and we'll ask you at a certain point to turn off the podcast and do a, a written exercise, which I think you'll really enjoy. You don't have to do it, but you'll get, you'll learn some pretty fantastic things if, if you do this, this exercise. Uh, if you're driving, listening to the podcast, uh, don't do the written exercise because <laughs> you'll think die. About it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so wait till you get, till you get home <laughs> right. and, and do it, do it then. But we always, uh, ask a person, uh, Suppose there's a magic button. After we empathize, I empathize with them for a period of time. And at a certain point, I asked him, what's my grade? And he said I was getting an A on empathy. And then I asked, you know, is there something here you want help with? You, you issue the invitation. Yeah, it's called the invitation step. It's the first step of paradoxical agenda settings, T-E-A-M. T, I measured all of his feelings were intense. E, I empathized. And A, agenda setting, we want to... Uh, reduce his his resistance because resistance is pretty intense in social anxiety. And so I said, suppose there's a ma- suppose there's a magic button. If you press it, you'll be. Uh... Well, I said, what what would you want out of this session? You know, if at the end of the session you walk out of here and say, oh boy, that session blew my socks off. What would you be hoping for? And and he and he said, well, all of these negative thoughts and feelings would disappear. So then he can be confident and and, and flirt and and things like that. And I and I said, well, we don't have a magic button, but I've got some awesome techniques, and, and that w- would be possible to make that happen. Uh, in fact, that probably is going to happen. But but be- before we do that, maybe we better think twice and ask ourselves, what what do these negative thoughts and feelings show about you? That that's positive and awesome. And so I'll ask you if if if, if you'd like to do the exercise, just uh, and then once you turn the tape recorder back or the tape recorder, your cell phone or whatever, turn the podcast back on. Rhonda and I will will do. You can hear Rhonda and I doing this exercise. But ask, look at his negative thoughts and feelings. You know he's got these eight different kinds of negative feelings and 10 different negative thoughts that we just reviewed with you. Ask yourself, what do these negative thoughts and feelings say about Jason and his core values as a human being that's positive and awesome? That's that's the first thing. And the second thing, what are some benefits to, to Jason 
of all of his all of his negative thoughts and feelings. You have to ask those two questions so you can just make a big master list of positives. And and the idea is the thing what are the things he's going to lose if he presses that magic button? In, in other words, he he thinks his negative thoughts and feelings are problems that he wants to get rid of. But we're going to go in the opposite direction and say what do these negative thoughts and feelings show about Jason that's beautiful and positive and awesome? And number two, how will these negative thoughts and feelings help him? So um, if you have a paper and pencil handy or a pen, uh, turn off the podcast now and see how many you can come up with. And then in a second, you can turn the podcast back on and and uh, Rhonda and I will do this exercise in real time. So one, two, three, turn it off now. And now turn it back on. Yay. So we're, <laughs> we're back. Right. So uh, let, let's see what we can come up with here, uh, Rhonda. What, well, I, you know, his one, one of his thoughts is um, – um, if I keep my mouth, I have to keep my mouth set, or I'll upset her. And that doesn't that show that you know that he has compassion and caring for other people. He yeah, so let's upset put someone. that n- number one. I'm going to write write that down. He's 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 concerned about the uh, the feelings of others, and and doesn't want to uh, uh, doesn't want to to upset people. Yeah, does, and that's a really important value. Yeah, absolutely. And it shows that he's kind of humble. Uh, number two, yeah, it shows that he's that he that he's he, he he's he's kind of humble that he he doesn't no, want to. He's not show, conceited. Sh- sh- yeah, ab- absolutely. But what are some more benefits? What are some benefits of his uh, shyness? Well, does isn't don't you think it's protecting him from rejection? And is that important? I think so. Absolutely. So number three, the uh, the shyness uh, pr- protects. Uh, from 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 rejection because if he presses the magic button, his shyness will instantly and totally disappear. So he'll go up and he'll be flirting like women like crazy, and then he could possibly risk getting rejected like crazy, and that hurts. Well, we can guarantee that he'll get rejected like like crazy because it happens to everyone. And furthermore, he's a beginner, so he'll probably be a bit bit, bit awkward, and 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 he'll he'll he will he will get get hurt uh, at at times. Uh, yeah. What are some other benefits? Well, it, doesn't it show that he values relationships? Yeah, uh-huh. That's right. He he, he values re- relationships. That's what he, yeah. He, he feels lonely. I didn't put that down, but I'm sure he feels tremendously lonely, and, and, and he values re- relationships. What, Otherwise, what are, he'd be happy being alone and not uh, yeah, in a relationship. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. That's a beautiful thing. Um, uh what are some other beautiful things? He, he's he's frustrated. He's he's angry. Uh, what, what, and he's very self-critical. What what does his self-criticism show about him? Um, more than being humble. Yeah, a lot more. Could show that he's willing to take a look at his flaws and try to improve himself. So he has high standards. He has high standards, and and also he's willing to be accountable, uh, and 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 see his flaws. Right. And 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 you can see that his high standards. Uh, you you know he has very high standards for for himself, and and he is saying that he might be the one to to goof up, that he has faults and flaws. That those are beautiful things right now. Um, you know, when he what says, you, go ahead, what, what else? What do you think it means that he says, you know, he must be a terrible person because he's concerned with, you know, superficiality? Yeah, what does Number that show eight. about him? Um, That's really cool. Well, it shows that he has some depth in his life and he wants to pay attention to things that are really meaningful and important to him. I love that. Yeah, he wants meaningful, wants meaningful uh, r- relations. Uh, uh, and he wants to be a person of mean, of you know, a meaningful person. Absolutely. What 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 are some awesome things about his 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 anger? He's ninety percent angry. Well, sometimes anger can be motivating. Oh, there we go. Yeah, like he's coming to to get help. Right. 
and and I'm going to be pushing him to do some pretty difficult things. Yes. Uh, so the. So do you uh, think some of his anger could be uh, camouflaging or um, showing he is courageous? Um, can anger and well, can you courage? motivate him and, and, to, and to to take the courage to take the action he's going to have to do to 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 change his life? A absolutely. Um, because um, I thought usually anxiety is motivating more so than anger. I'm sorry? Isn't anxiety more motivating than anger? Well, they can be um, motivating in, diff in different ways. Uh, how uh, I see the anger is motivating because he's really going to be mad at himself. He's going to get charged up and charged up here and, and do something. I see the anxiety as protecting himself and being v v vigilant so he doesn't, he doesn't screw up. Mm, yes, um, that's true. Mm -hmm. uh, and the anxiety might help him continue to practice over and over again until he gets he, it right. Yeah, yeah. The now he's guilty. What is, what does his guilt show about him that's positive and awesome? Well, it, that he cares what other people think of him. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, that that's true. Uh, and we that was number one on our list. But I'm thinking, in addition, that he he has a moral compass. Mm -hmm. That that he that he's holding himself to that he's he's not going to be real disruptive in a grocery store or right you know that uh, and uh, but anyway the, these are the, this is the type of thing and if we had him here we we could spend a lot more time on this but this is kind of how how it works you see anything else any other biggies we should. Uh, yeah, he says if if I get shot down, that'll show what a, what a loser I am. Well, uh, that that could also we we could say that he's realistic, be, 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 because you know he he may you know have you know not great flirting and conversational skills since so he's he's been avoiding women all of his life. So and we're all flawed in our own way. So maybe he's just really accepting of his own flaws. Yeah, yeah, right. So, uh, how do we bring this to closure, Rhonda? Well, we would want to point out to him that if he pushed the magic button and got rid of all the negative thoughts and feelings, he would also get rid of all these beautiful and positive things about himself and, all, and get rid of his values. And does he really want to get rid of all of these positive things? Or his, yeah. No, he doesn't. Yeah. So, we would ask him then, we would let him know that instead of a magic button, we have a magic dial. And so, we would ask him... If he would want to, if he could dial down his negative emotions so that he can get the, maintain the benefit of all of them, but eliminate the suffering and pain they cause him. Yeah, and what would be a you know a healthy amount of anxiety, uh, and what would be a healthy amount of guilt. Right. And 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 also another thing about his uh, he's fifty percent down. Uh, what what we forgot to say? What's beautiful about the fact that he feels sad and down? Well. What is beautiful about feeling sad and down? Um, that he knows he can, that he can feel better one day? No. Nope. <laughs> no. I don't know, I'm stumped. <laughs> that's the, the great thing about sadness is you get rid of it, but that's not no. positive reframing. No, that's, not. <laughs> that's the conventional thing. Right. Well, um, there's something very beautiful about being sad and down. See, well, more than what we've already said, I mean, it's real. Um, I think it gives another flavor here that um, it, it shows his, his longing for a loving relationship, mm -hmm. his his passion for for life, and so it's kind of tender and beautiful that he feels sad and down. If if he was happy, he'd be kind of a sociopath, right? And so it really shows his his tender side. Yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, yeah, so he decided he he. Uh, you know, definitely wanted to to dial all these down to to to, to pretty pretty low levels, and uh, and then that's the that, that's the end of dealing with his so-called outcome resistance. But we have to deal with his process resistance, and and those are the two forms of resistance in overcoming shyness. Outcome resistance is 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 you know, do I really want to get better? Uh, could press the magic button, you get better. Well, maybe it's not such a good idea to press that magic button. But process resistance, what, what does that have to do with? Process resistance is that you may not want to do what you have to do in order to get better. 
And what's he going to have to do to get better? Well, he's going to have to confront his fears. He's, we're going to have to teach him how to flirt and push him to do more social interactions. Yeah. And we have a lot of techniques in order to do and that. Suppose he says, you have to make my anxiety go away first, and then I'll flirt with women. What would you say? I'd say, well, people talk about first they need to be motivated before they can do something. Hi, we came in here to get away from the sound. <laughs> Here in Murrieta Studios, we're recording live right now. Yes, you're on it. <laughs> so Do you have anything to say about social anxiety? You're part of our podcast. <laughs> That's my wife just came in. We got there was a mower, so we came in here. Okay. Yeah, so anyway, <laughs> so if somebody so. asked me if they had to feel motivated to get over their social anxiety first, I'd say no. What you have to do is do the techniques first, and then the motivation will follow. Yeah, because motivation I, that, sometimes that, that, never comes. Yeah, yeah. I say you're not entitled to be motivated to flirt with women until you're really good at it and they're chasing you. Then yeah. you'll be very motivated. Right. But if you want me to work with you, I, I'm going to tell you to do things that are going to make you very anxious. And you have to give me an irreversible uh, guarantee that you'll do the things that I ask you to do, even if they they freak you out at, out at first. So you're going to offer you're going to offer him the the technique of dangling the carrot where you're going to let him know that you have hundreds of techniques that could help him yeah and and encourage him by by letting by letting him know that you have the tools yeah. for him to get over this yeah and then you're going to offer what you just said as a gentle ultimatum that yeah. you're going to, you want a commitment from him that he will do what you're going to ask him yeah. to do yeah most of the tools I'm going to show you you're going to love they won't threaten you yeah. but you must agree if you want me to work with you to do shame attacking exercises smile and hello practice the talk show host te- technique and 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 uh, self disclosure and a lot of things that will be very uncomfortable and then what will you do if he says he doesn't want to do that uh, Find another shrink. <laughs> <laughs> so then what you'll do is... I'm not the guy you're looking for. So uh, you'll offer him the op- what you call sitting with open hands. Yeah. Ju- get, let ju- him just, make the decision. Yeah, just say, I'd love to work with you, and I think you're awesome, and it would be a joy to show you how to convert your love life from rags to riches, and I'm absolutely certain we can do that if we work together. But you have to be willing to pay the price, which is uh, doing things that will, will frighten you. And I'll do some of them with you if you like. Well, I'll, I'll go with you to the gates of hell. That would be great. Uh, but uh, you have to do that if, if you want me to. Okay, so let's assume Jason you. says yes to everything. So, yeah, he was all on board. And, and the thought he wanted to help with first then was people will think I'm a self-centered jerk if I, if I try to flirt with her. Now, some of you are familiar with the 10 cognitive distortions. One of the first things we do is say, what, what, what are the cognitive distortions in that thought? Uh, so let me go through them one at a time, and you can tell me uh, if each distortion, if you think. And you, you can, who are listening too, uh, I'll ask you too, and then we'll see what, what Rhonda says. But the first of the 10 distortions is all or nothing thinking. And, and, he has the thought, people will think I'm a self-centered jerk if I try to flirt with her. Is that an example of all or nothing thinking? You can say yes or no and uh, put a tick on a piece of paper or you write down yes or no. And now Rhonda will tell us what do you think. I do think it's an example of all or nothing thinking because it's either all people will think he's a jerk or no one will think he's a jerk. Y- and yes. he is focusing on that all people will think he's a jerk. Yes, but also he's thinking jerkiness is all or nothing. You're either a jerk or a non-jerk. Do, do, do you True, see? Right. And you can so also say he's labeling himself. Yep. Yeah. Do, do, and the, the real question is, not do jerks exist? Does jerky behavior exist? Well, I imagine it exists on a continuum. Yeah, and we all act jerky at times, but there's no such thing as a jerk. But as you point out, everyone will have different different ideas about that, and and. Uh, uh, you know, some people might think it's awesome that he's talking to to a young lady he's he's attracted to. Yeah. So it's definitely all or nothing thinking. How about overgeneralization? I think it's an example of overgeneralization. And tell us why you're you're right again. <laughs> because he thinks he's being a jerk all the time. Any time he talks to a young lady, he's gonna think he thinks that all people will think he's a jerk all the time. Yes, and also he's generalizing so, uh, from a specific behavior. Which, by the way, may not even happen to to himself, and and that's what I we were talking about. I think in the last podcast, 
the, the pain comes when you think you have a self that people are going to judge. He's not worried about people dr- judging his behavior. We all act jerky at times. We all screw up at times. But just when you think people will think I'm a jerk, that I have a self that, that, that's defective. So he's generalizing from his thought to all people. From his mistake. From his mistake. If he makes a mistake, then people think I'm a jerk, mm-hmm. as if there was such a thing, and that his whole self would then be, be contaminated, mm-hmm. rather wow. than just screwing up and not flirting skillfully. Yep. How about mental filter? So mental filter is when you focus on all of the negatives, and it does seem like that is true as well, because he's focusing on the negative of his behavior and also a negative consequence that could or could not happen. That's a good one. How about discounting the positive? Well, I actually think there could be a, a, a discounting the positive because he's not he's discounting any time that he might have spoken to a, a woman and had a good experience. Well, that's zero. That's zero? Well, he, never, he hasn't flirted with anybody. He's never had a positive experience. But it's discounting the positive in the, in the following sense. If he talks with a young woman and gets shot down, is that good or bad? Well, to him, it's bad. I'm asking Rhonda. It could be both. It's bad because it might hurt his feelings, and it's good because then he can find someone else that would be interested in him. But why else is it good for a shy person to talk to someone and get shot down? Because it gives them experience. Yeah, because he's confronting his fears. Right. So it's, it's actually extremely good. If he were to talk to her and she isn't interested, then he's confronted his, his fears. So that's a, a huge a huge bonus. Nice. Um, how about jumping to conclusions? Well, it is jumping in conclusions because he's jumping to the conclusion without any data that it's true that um, people will think he's a self-centered jerk. Yeah, yeah. so that's mind reading. That's mind he's reading. imagining. And this is classic with all people with social anxiety. They're, they're absolutely convinced that... People are going to re- reject me. They're going to look down on me. They'll judge me. They're 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 going to judge me with, with, without any without any data at, at all. And it's also another form of jumping to conclusions. It's fortune telling. See, he's predicting not only is she going to shoot me down, but in addition, uh, people are going to start you know, talking about me and judging me, and they'll go home and say, oh, sweetheart, I had the most horrible experience in the Safeway. I saw a young man uh, flirting with with the woman checking groceries, and, oh, it was just such a horrible experience for me, and, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> oh, my that. God, it was self- he was such a self-centered jerk. It ruined my whole grocery shopping experience. Yeah, yeah. and, and what that brings us to the next distortion, magnification and minimization. He's magnifying how awful it would be if he made a fool of himself. And he's minimizing his own courage and in, in taking a chance and in, in confronting his fears. Now, how, here's another distortion, Rhonda. Emotional reasoning. This, this is number s- seven. So emotional reasoning is, I feel like I'm a jerk, so I must be a jerk. Yeah, yeah. So that's how, and, and I feel like I'm a loser, So I must be a loser, and I feel like I'm going to get shot down, so I'm going to get shot down. And I feel like I'm on the edge of some horrible things, so this must be an extremely dangerous situation that that, that I'm in. Labeling, we've already said, he's labeling himself as a jerk. The world doesn't break into jerks and non-jerks, just human beings, and we're all jerky some of the time, and no one's jerky all of the time. Right. How about is it a should statement? People will think I'm a self-centered jerk if I try to flirt with her. Yes, it's a hidden should. Oh, I, I shouldn't be a jerk. Or I should. I should be perfect. I should never make a mistake. Yeah, I should never get shot down. I, I should never do anything jerky. I should never do anything that people will judge. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever done anything jerky? I, I did something jerky just a few hours ago. Oh, you did. What did <laughs> you do? <laughs> did you get into that shoplifting again? <laughs> <laughs> Don't say. <laughs> what did you do? Oh, I thought I was more important than I really am. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, and then I refused to talk to a friend about it. Oh, 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 oh! You were alluding to something. <laughs> I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yes, right. Recall. That was kind of jerky. Wasn't <laughs> yeah, it was. I was filled with my own self-importance, which is always oh, yeah, being a jerk. Oh, yeah, yeah. I love that. Thank you. Uh, and then self-blame and other be- blame. People will think I'm a self-centered jerk if I try to talk with her. Is that blame? 
It is blame. He's blaming himself and he's blaming others. Yeah. So those are the, the ten, ten di distortions. And in the old days, that used to be not terribly helpful to people. It was always minimally helpful. But now in this, this modern era, uh, when we do positive reframing, often that's just go through the distortions and then the person can come up ways of uh, sma smashing these thoughts. But we'll take the old fashioned approach here and talk about all, all the different tools we can use to help him smash this thought. So you, you see that there's a lot to choose from. And now let's see how our, we're doing on time because we could break this into two podcasts too. We don't want it to, to run too long. We started at 1.49 and we had a little bit of a break there due to the sound problems. What time is it now? 2.43. Oh, so I'm, I'm wondering if we could almost uh, stop the podcast at this point. Okay. Does and that make could, sense? And yeah, then, we could do the methods. Yeah, we'll go through through all the methods, but just to give you a, a preview, we're going to generate a recovery circle and select 10 or 15 methods that we can use to help uh, Jason smash this this negative thought. And so you'll see the power, all, all the really amazing things we can do once we've, we've got a specific thought at a, at a specific moment and how you can use that to to really, really change your life. And, and that's what I really want from for all you folks who are struggling with social anxiety. And also, if you're a therapist, I'm, I'm, I'm also hopeful this will will help you in your clinical work. I, I get a lot of emails from therapists too, very kind emails saying that this workshop of yours that I went to or or the the book of yours I read or the podcast has just transformed my my clinical practice. And if those of you who want uh, more workshops, uh, I have the, uh, on May 19th, this is the, the end of the podcast for today and next time we'll pick up and we'll do the next part on social anxiety, but I'm going to, on May 19th, 2019, uh, I'm going to do a workshop with Dr. Jill Levitt, who I teach with at Stanford in my Tuesday training group. And we're going to do Team CBT for Anxiety Disorders, step-by-step -step training for therapists. It'll be a one-day workshop. Uh, it's almost sold out in person. I think there's only two or three slots yet left, even though it's still, let's say, March... April. March 10th. Today's March 10th. Yeah, Mar yeah, so it's April, May. It's like wow. more, more than two months away. But in person, it's almost sold out. So you have to move real fast if you want to come in, in person in Palo Alto. But we have lots of slots still available. They will probably sell out at some point too because we can only take so many online because we have to have trainers online to help the online people. But uh, if you go to my website, feelinggood.com, Click on the workshop tab and you can find the link to learn more about this. There's seven CE credits. I think it costs 135 bucks. The people come in person, you're going to get fabulous free breakfast and fabulous free lunch. And you get to hang out with some really neat people. Well, too. the lunch is a, a potluck. Everybody brings and nurtures each other with delicious food. That's why the food is so good. If you go right. to a hotel, you get this hotel food. But at this place, it's potluck. So people bring really beautiful things. In fact, I, I brought... Last time, really fantastic stuff I brought from Manresa, those fabulous pastries. They have some of the best pastries in the world, and uh, they were super expensive, but I bought 15 of them. It cost like $90 or oh something. Oh, my goodness. But they're like, wow, thank you so much. They were so delicious. <laughs> they are delicious. And other people brought fabulous oh, yeah. stuff, too. And then the two summer intensives, July 15 to 18, 2019, I'm going to do my four-day summer Canadian intensive, in Calgary, and Jack Hirose and Associates uh, are uh, sponsoring that one. Again, you can find the link on my workshop tab on my website. And then in July, uh, late July, July 29th to August 1st, 2019, you can uh, find the link to the South San Francisco four-day intensive, which is pretty much just about always my best workshop of the year. And we're going to do live demonstrations. You can work on your personal stuff. We're going to show you how to increase your empathy skills, show you how to melt away therapeutic resistance, show you how to boost your your outcomes and your clinical work by, by using sophisticated assessment and tracking procedures. We're going to teach you at least 20 or 
25, if not more, of the 100 methods that, that we use. And it's, it's just a great thing. And so. maybe Brandon Vance will have a song for us. Oh, yeah, Brandon will be there. He makes up feeling good songs, and he's really uh, very so talented. talented. Oh, and Sonny is going to come, Sonny Choi, and nice. talk. He was a huge hit last last year. He talked about using team with people who can't speak English with, with almost no resources, people with, with, with very little funds. Uh, he often has to work through an interpreter. The agency where he works, he, he only gets to spend about 35 minutes a session with people. And he, most of his patients recover in three or four sessions. And it was people, they couldn't believe it. They, it, he, he, and he's, he's such a humble fellow. And working with that population, he, it was just a standing ovation for, for Sonny. And so I asked him if he'd, if he'd come back. So oh, that's great. there's going to be a lot of great stuff. So come to one of those workshops and, uh, and we'll see you next week. Thank see you. See you next week. Thank you. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast. For more information, visit Dr. Burns' website at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes for this episode under the podcast page. You will also find archives of previous episodes and many resources for therapists and non-therapists. We welcome your comments and questions. If you want to support the show, please share the podcast with people who might benefit from it. You could also go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. The theme music is Gypsy Jazz in Paris, 1935, composed and performed by Brett Van Donsel. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.